the answers are. So we are ready to talk about metabolism and energy. Cellular and chemical processes. And these terms have specific meanings. Cellular metabolism, the complete array of chemical reactions that we find in living cells of any kind. But of course here we are interested in, um, I'm sorry, I'm pausing because there's a, an emergency test and a vocal announcement going on right now and it distracted me just making sure it was a test instead of an actual alert. So back to cellular metabolism. The complete array of chemical reactions that go on in your body is called metabolism. Because we are heterotrophs, we are other feeders, and we obtain our energy from chemical energy from our food. We just learned about the digestive tract. We break our metabolism down into two great big parts. Now, catabolism refers to reactions that break down molecules. Now, that's because the actual chemistry going on in the cell is going to use those smaller molecules, monomers. So an amino acid, a monosaccharide, a fatty acid, which quickly is broken down into acetyl groups. Those are the active uh, carbon fragments in our cells. And it is catabolism that delivers those to us. So the point here is that when you have a molecule, you have bonds and those bonds represent energy. When you break down our food material, our carbon fragments, they release that energy and we have to in some way capture that energy and convert it to the uses that support life. However, there is a secondary effect here. Uh, we do have the ability to build molecules up. We start out as a single squishy cell and that cell divides. So we have two, four, eight, 16 cells and so forth, producing the trillions of cells that make up our uh, mature body. That building process is called anabolism. And it's just the reverse of catabolism. We're going to take those monomers and use them as building blocks, like bricks in a wall. We're going to require energy in order to assemble those uh, monomers. So we've talked about the diversity and the total weight of protein in our body. Protein leads the way. It's energy that allows us to take amino acids and build the proteins that we require to support human life. Within the cell, we're talking about chemical energy. I think I made the point that on Earth here, there are four forces, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, gravity, and electromagnetism. And what we call chemistry, lives within that law of electromagnetism. You never can have one without the other. The energy is the bond energy between the atoms or between the monomers, if you're talking about a polymer, and the chemical reactions in an organism, starting with catabolism. These are the ones that break down our food and nutrient molecules. The small molecules can be used as building blocks. They also can break chemical bonds that release energy. So I want to point out, you never talk about a chemical reaction without understanding. You've got the material, the actual atoms themselves, and the energy that they contain or generate or release as you change their bonding. So the way that connects to humans, food, enters our body carrying high energy in their chemical bonds. We're breaking that down. We talked about food polymers being broken down to monomers and monomers being broken down to release energy. That energy is captured 
by this molecule, adenosine triphosphate. Here is a sugar. Here is an organic base, in this case adenine. And here is a chain of PO4s, phosphate groups. That forms what we call ATP. Now, ATP is sort of the transfer device, just like money is how we transfer our work into purchasing the things we need. We make ATP. ATP then, within the cell, hands over that energy whenever it's needed to synthesize a molecule, to make a protein, to transport a vesicle, to divide a cell. All those things take energy. That's ATP that's providing it. So the first lesson, ATP is our common currency for energy transfer in the cell. We see here the critical relationship. Here's ATP here. This is very high energy and it has one, two, three phosphate bonds. You can obtain some of that energy by breaking one phosphate off and getting ADP. Now that's just adenosine diphosphate plus a phosphate group. When you do that, energy is released and that energy has to be linked to or coupled to the synthesis or the work that you want to perform within the cell. These components then, ADP and phosphate, are completely reusable. They can go back in the mitochondrion where this uh, A phosphate can be stuck back onto an ADP to generate ATP. So this is kind of a cycle. ATP out to the work of the cell, ADP and phosphate back to the mitochondria where ATP is generated again and starts the cycle all over. To look at cellular, cellular metabolism on the whole, we have to understand that there is, we kind of lose the ability to write a specific chemical reaction. We can write a net equation. So we can say what happens when you break a glucose down completely to CO2 and water, even though in the body that rarely happens. And the, the idea that's a better idea is that the cell maintains this thing called a nutrient pool. Now that would be a pool in the cytoplasm of amino acids, of carbohydrates, of fatty acids, of lipid molecule, all of those things that are needed for the cell to synthesize what it needs. Those, of course, in our body come from outside the body, from our digestive and cardiovascular tract providing it. But here are the nutrients sitting in the cell. Now, we first have been talking a lot about energy. So I'm going to say that these nutrients are basically all carbon fragments. They can be split apart into usable monomers transferred into the cell into the mitochondria. When they are broken down, we generate CO2 and water, not shown on this diagram, and those that energy released when we break it down, about 40% can be transferred to the manufacture of ATP. 40% only. The other 60% simply escapes. It's sort of like you're making a liter of water and you've only got a 400 mil beaker. 600 mils runs over the top. So that becomes the heat that is generated when you're breaking this carbon down. We do not capture it. But what do we use ATP for? ATP can be used for lo locomotion. So we've seen that ATP is used in great quantities when we're performing that actin and myosin crossbridging. Every time we do a power stroke, one actin on one myosin on one actin uses one ATP. But on a smaller level, when we're pushing material along the digestive tract with cilia, we're up mucus up the respiratory, up the mucus escalator, we're burning ATP. 
two different kinds of locomotion, but both important. Whenever we contract a muscle, whenever we contract something like the cell membrane, whenever we transport something inside the cell. So we've talked about secretions being manufactured in the cell and making vesicles and those vesicles moving to the outer membrane to release them. That doesn't just happen by gravity. It basically requires ATP to do that movement. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm after mitosis. That doesn't just happen. You have to pinch that membrane down and separate the cell into two compartments. Finally, when you get to those vesicles, get to the membrane, or when material is approaching the membrane from the outside, if you're moving that vesicle, either expelling through endocytosis or absorbing through exocytosis, both what we called bulk transport, that takes ATP. Now up here, you'll notice the connection of the ATP to anabolism. Anytime you're taking moms and building them into polymers, you're going to be using energy in the cytoplasm of the cell. So what are some of those things? The big words. We're going to have to maintain the cell once we have it. So we're going to have to maintain it and repair it. That takes ATP. When we grow, we basically do that by making cells and then differentiating those cells into their specialized kinds. Uh, cell division and cell differentiation growth requires ATP. Whenever we secrete from a cell, we release a substance, whether it's on an organ level. So the gallbladder is an organ that secretes uh, bile. Um, but within uh, uh, a system. You might have individual cells like goblet cells performing that secretion. Whenever we store reserves, so when we take glucose and we polymerize it up into glycogen, and then we take glycogen and break it back down into glucose, those stored reserves are managed based on anabolic buildup. Now this is monomers to polymers we then can take those polymers and break them down. That will contribute back to the nutrient pool. But I want to I want to point out something about this circle. This is not perfect. It's not like we build up material like uh, bile, for example. We manufacture bile as a secretion, and we use it, and then we basically. Uh, return some of it to the nutrient pool. Some must, much of it is expelled as waste. So the overview of anabolism and catabolism is shown here. Let's look more completely at those processes. Two things always come from our diet. I want to point out. It comes, uh, when we talk about carbon fragments entering the body, they're carrying the building blocks we need. They're carrying amino acids and polysaccharides and, and um, we're, we're, we talk about uh, fatty acids. We can manufacture some of those, but we obtain a, a lot of them strictly by diet. So this isn't something that the nutritionist has to study and learn. So we talk about the nine essential amino acids meaning we have to get those amino acids in our food from the proteins we eat. The other 11, we can synthesize to some extent. However, the nine essential ones have to be provided by our food because we can't make them. So that's number one building block. The second thing is that in the bonds of those nutrients, we have chemical energy. And this is the energy that's going to be transferred to make ATP. So always remember, energy and materials, building block, go hand in hand. And this is where that carbon chemistry comes to mind again. We're going to take carbon, we're going to build up monomers. Glucose always has the same formula. And you can use it to make different polymers. Plants make starch, where we make glycogen. Plants make cellulose, which we can neither make nor digest. 
all made of glucose. So these, this idea, so I think of it as a brick. Once you have a brick, what can you make? Anything you can imagine. And um, the monomers act as our building blocks. Now, nutrient use, I want to reinforce a point we've made before about digestion. There are specific forms that we have to extract from the food in order for them to be useful. So up here above this box, this top box, where it says triglycerides, we actually should have lit food with lipids. And the lipids, once they're in the body, are often in those chylomicrons, those micelles and chylomicrons, converted to triglycerides. This is a big circulation form. And when it gets to the cell, we're going to change that to a fatty acid. That's what we use down here in the mitochondria. Up here above, we should say carbohydrate in various forms is converted to glucose to make glycogen. Glycogen then provides the glucose on a constant basis within those ranges of variation for homeostasis. And we can use glucose to generate carbon chains here in the mitochondria. Proteins is a dietary component, and we break those two amino acids, although proteins will have a cost. Because to use them to make energy, we're going to have to deaminate them, take the nitrogen off, and that's going to be generate a deadly poison. So here in the mitochondrion, which was once a free living cell, but now is an organelle in the eukaryotic cells of the world and ours, we're going to have small carbon chains and oxygen. So here we are. Here's the digestive tract endpoint delivering this carbon from our diet to the mitochondrion in the cell. And the oxygen from our respiratory tract. Those are the inputs. And the TCA or tricarboxylic acid cycle, you may have heard it called the Krebs cycle. We now prefer tricarboxylic acid. It's the same thing. That harvest some of that energy and release the carbon as CO2. But energy carriers have absorbed that energy essentially by bonding with high energy electrons from the, the nutrient molecules. Those energy carriers bring that energy over to the electron transport system where a majority of the ATP is produced. Now, I want to mention they've left out some ATP here, and they've left out the energy carriers, NADH and so forth. This produces some direct energy, but most of the ATP comes from this electron transport system. The ATP then is a uh, temporary product. It's going to carry energy out to anything that we're doing, dividing a cell or transporting a vesicle, and there's another thing that's odd about this reaction. Oxygen, you'll notice, is only important to the electron transport system and its function. And everybody remember this. What is the function of oxygen? It is the final electron acceptor from the electron transport system. The electron transport system is a series of proteins. And these carriers come over and dump a pair of, an, a pair of high energy electrons to the first acceptor. And that energy, of the electrons, are then transferred to the second acceptor and energy is released. And the third acceptor and energy is released. So the carriers are getting lower and lower energy and those electrons are getting lower and lower in energy. On some of those energy release steps, that energy is coupled with electron pumps and movement within the mitochondria that will allow us to make ATP. But in general, it steps down those carriers, sort of like stepping down a stairway to the bottom step. On the bottom step is where oxygen takes those electrons and hydrogen ion from the matrix and makes water. So this water is not water we drink or water we just pump around. This is actually a product of this process. We will call it metabolic water, and it will contribute about 300 mils a day to our water balance. 
So we're ready to summarize kind of that overall anatomical picture, the cell with mitochondria inside. The cytoplasm is going to be important and the mitochondria are going to be important to this energy production. Usually we will start by using glucose and that's kind of not all inclusive. Every carbon fragment isn't a glucose, but we do take a lot of carbon fragments and especially uh, monosaccharides and convert them to glucose in our body. Uh, so this is really very broad reaching. Also, we have to make glucose because this is the only nutrient our brain and spinal cord use. Here is the six oxygen and they generate, if you could do this to one glucose completely, you would get six carbon dioxide and six water and 36 ATP from the entire process. Now, because of the nutrient pool idea, uh, sometimes you'll shunt some of those intermediate products out of the energy production system and use them as a building block. But we're not going to, I'm not going to mess with that right now. Let's just think about this process that we call aerobic respiration. Respiration because it uses oxygen and the chemical uh, reaction on the cellular level. Sometimes this is also called cellular respiration. Now, this is what all heterotrophs, including all animals, all microorganisms that capture and feed other cells. So you've seen videos of amoeba capturing another cell, killing it and eating it by um, by endocytosis, or sometimes it's called phagocytosis on that level. But those are all heterotrophs. The thing I want to point out is that this net reaction is the reverse, almost the reverse, of carbon dioxide. So a plant if you take the ATP and, no, a plant can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water and sunlight and through an organelle in its body called the chloroplast can reverse this. The process of light capture makes ATP and that ATP allows you to take these CO2s and stick them together. So. The reverse process is called photosynthesis and generates carbon fragments. I'm going to basically just stay with the glucose and six oxygen. Look, look at this. Photosynthesis makes the reduced carbon all living things uh, need, but it also generates free oxygen. This reverse reaction is the reason that we have such high levels of productivity because we can capture our carbon out of the air, but also why we have an oxygen atmosphere, because photosynthesis makes it. So together we have this flow of carbon and oxygen, carbon dioxide and energy in the form of sunlight flowing around between and among different life forms. So earlier we saw a diagram that said if you want to transport a vesicle, if you want to divide a cell, you need ATP. Well, if you ask where does that energy come from, well, it comes from our nutrient molecules. And where does that bond energy come from? Well, it comes from the organisms that made those food things like starch. And where does that come from? It comes from sunlight. So in our ecosystem, we're actually talking about a radiant energy, sunlight, with the majority of the energy we harvest being in those visible wavelengths that we see with our eyes, the photoactive wavelengths, 400 to 700 nanometers, visible light. So when we talk about heterotrophs, we run on ATP, but that ATP comes eventually from sunlight. So together, aerobic respiration and photosynthesis are cycling carbon in and energy through the system. The carbon does truly cycle 
in that we take CO2 out of the air, we build it up into reduced carbon like glucose, we break it down to make ATP, we build it back up, and so the carbon dioxide, the mineral actually does cycle. The energy is kind of harder to see, it arrives as sunlight, it moves through different chemical forms, but when we break that chemical in the glucose down to CO2, uh, some of the energy is captured as ATP and later spent doing work in the cell. Um, the 60% uh, of that energy in, in making the ATP is released back into the universe. So it doesn't actually cycle back to someone. That's another further story. Nutrient storage and utilization is a specialty in the body. We talk about glucose, we talk about fats. They are not just a general metabolic process that occur in all cells. Sometimes, when, when we look at a specific nutrient, it can typically only be stored in certain locations. And so we're gonna to try to summarize those energy storage areas and how they are deposited and how they're mobilized. The areas we're going to look at is the liver, the adipose tissue, those cells called adipocytes that can accumulate lipid uh, in the form of fat. Skeletal muscle can store uh, energy in certain, in certain forms. Glycogen is the main carbohydrate storage. Amino acids must be constantly available. They also have a couple of, uh, as we saw last semester, a couple of short-term energy uh, storage forms. Nervous tissue, we're going to mention because it cannot store energy at all, and it only uses blood glucose. Now, this is very interesting because we actually identify ourselves, our lives, based on the continuity of our memory and our knowledge. So if I got up tomorrow and I was no longer Bruce Carr, and I was no longer a professor at Jefferson College, because my mind had broken down, then I would have lost my identity. But nervous tissue, instead of being versatile like all the other tissues in the body, can only use this one nutrient. Then I'm going to basically lump all the other tissues in the body into one, uh, to you know, one large bucket. Basically, say sorry, no nutrient storage and conversion in those tissues. So let's start with the liver. We keep coming back to the liver. Anecdotal. I don't think we give it its due. In my mind, it deserves to be a system of its own because of the diversity of the things it, it does makes many enzymes that are involved in digestive processing and sometimes that happens directly in the liver such as the storage of and the conversion of glucose into glycogen so episodes of feeding spike our blood sugar up the liver gets busy and stores that as glycogen now after 45 minutes or an hour when the blood sugar starts to go down, it takes that glycogen, pops those glucose out, puts them back in the bloodstream. So glycogen and glycogen conversion is a big part of our energy storage cycle. It's how we can eat in episodes that are far apart in time, five hours apart between meals, but we maintain our blood sugar in a relatively narrow range. Adipose tissue shown here, stored lipids. In our body, we usually store them as triglycerides. That's the chemical uh, formula and chemical name for the lipid component. And we do have a very complex regulation mechanism telling the body when we can release that energy from stored fat and when we should hold on to it. Now I'll point out that adipose tissue is really interested. It is one of the three effectors. Do you remember muscles, glands, and fat? 
but I kind of want to relate adipose tissue in a different way. We are, since we eat other living things, we're constantly taking lipids in and utilizing them. We saw that at rest, our consciousness, our alertness, our metabolic functions are supported by a constant flow of fatty acids. But when we eat more than we burn, we accumulate those in special cells called adipocytes. And that's the fat deposits in our body. Now the body hangs on to fat deposits. So we're a little stubborn about giving them up. That's why today's diet crazes are so diverse and often so frustrating. We eat less food. We deny the pleasure of eating. By the way, the behaviors that are kind of part of our nervous system and part of our uh, overall uh, metabolism will support gorging and the accumulation of fat. And fat. And that, the reason is the conditions under which we evolved. So the conditions we evolved under often involved a climate and a set of seasons where we had a season of plenty followed by a season of want. The season of plenty is when things grow. So new leaves, eventually new fruits, often the uh, production and reproduction of animals that we may feed upon are coordinated with that spring and summer and fall season of plenty. And during that time, if you find excess calories in the form of nutrients, and you eat them, and you put on fat, you're storing that up for the season of want. So autumn comes, all the plants stop growing in the, in the Missouri area. They drop their leaves. They store their nutrient material in the form of sugars deep, deep in their root system where they're difficult to get at in the frozen ground. And so during this time, there's no productivity. You may have an abundance of game compared to your population size. And so you can still continue to kill animals and eat them, but you are going to be depleting those herds or those sources of nutrition as the winter goes on. Now, during that time of want, if you have fat deposits, you have a better chance of surviving. And so actually during the initial times of hunger, the body doesn't immediately start converting fat. What it does is it will reach into muscle and it will tear down muscle and live off the protein. It will convert all the carbohydrate in the body, but it will leave the fat alone. And so that's why you have to diet carefully, combining exercise and movement with caloric intake in order to lose fat in a directed way. Season of plenty, season of want. And if you have a metabolism that deposits fat, then you have a better chance of surviving in the natural environment. Now, what happens when humans form societies and cultures? And the main uh, elements of success for their survival and reproduction is shifted from the natural environment to relationships with other human beings, social and cultural issues. We've been so successful at our food science and food production that in a, a lucky country and a hardworking country like the United States, we can provide unlimited calories 24 7, 365. But we still have those impulses, hunger, and the impulse to gorge, especially in the arm. And so we build up that fat without a season of want that is going to reduce it back down. And as a result, we end up with a, a, a current complicating factor and fair to call it an emerging epidemic of obesity. So adipose tissue is a, the second big storage region also, I want to say something about the difference between oil and fat. Oil is something that's liquid and acellular outside the body. So you can crush plants 
and extract the oil. So olive oil is an extraction, cottonseed oil. This is stored as an energy supply for the reproductive parts, such as seeds, but it's liquid at, real, uh, at room temperature and it is uh, acellular. In animals, we take those lipids, which typically would be in the form of an oil, and we put them in cells called adipocytes. This makes them solid at room temperature. So when you're dealing with your evening cooking and you're trimming a pork uh, roast, uh, what you're trimming off are the cellular components and the oil inside them. Skeletal muscle burns more ATP than uh, per unit uh, per, per second than any other tissue. So we have a second place where carbohydrate can be stored and that's inside the muscle. When we are uh, not exercising, when we're feeding well, we're going to fill those tanks with glycogen so that if we have to take off on a fight or flight uh, situation, uh, we will have a ready delivery of carbohydrate right in the muscle where we need it. Remember the actin and myosin proteins that made up the sarcomere? We can also break down those proteins in emergencies for material and energy. So under sustained exercise or sustained emergency, we're not only going to pull all the carbohydrate out of the muscle and convert it, we're actually going to begin to break down the actin and myosin itself. This is what leads to the soreness following a big endurance event. Um, if you go anaerobic, the acid irritates the remaining nerves, but amino acids can be used for a source of energy. Now, nervous tissue, look at that bold a label, no reserves. We don't store carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins. None. Also remember that the central nervous system is wrapped in the neuroglia, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, and they're behind the blood-brain barrier. So we basically are running the central nervous system on blood glucose only. These are not cells that are versatile in their nutrient conversion, only glucose. And as a result, the priority goes to the central nervous system. So we saw this with blood flow, the flow to skeletal muscles, the flow to digestive organs goes way up and down based on our level of activity, based on when we ate last. But the flow of uh, blood to the brain was constant, regardless of how active we were or whether we were feeding or not. And for the mass of the brain, fairly high. Um, so this kind of priority for the brain and spinal cord um, uh, makes it sort of that last stake in the ground. We're not going to back up past this stake. Uh, when we go into shock um, or stress, we may cut down blood flow to the periphery, for example, to our fingers and toes. We may shut down blood flow uh, on a regular basis. Lots of, when we become very active physically, we shut down blood flow to the digestive tract. Those kinds of regulatory changes are not present for the brain. The brain must receive that constant flow of blood for us to stay ourselves. All other peripheral tissues, there are no metabolic reserves. They are versatile in terms of what they can utilize in carbo. The, the, here the nutrition label gives you your clue. They typically label fat as the most recognizable term for lipid. That includes oils, it includes waxes, anything that has that hydrophobic molecular structure that will not mix with water. It contains proteins, and of course, proteins, the amino acids, are uh, what we are, are interested in. And then finally, carbohydrates, often listing sugars separately, but basically recognizing that it's the monosaccharide component there that's important. 
Preferred energy source does vary from tissue to tissue, and there is a hormone reflect influence that's important in the utilization of um, uh, nutrients. Now, our metabolism, the chemical reactions that are going on in our cells, kind of uh, uh, regulated or relevant to the organ, organ system, and whole organism activities that we have. So how do we relate it all the way up to the whole organism? Well, we have basically two patterns related to our digestive system that we call the absorptive state and the post-absorptive state. And here's how it works. Periodically, we sit down to eat a meal. This is then a short time when we're putting a whole bunch of nutrient carbon fragments into our body. Now, very quickly, the body converts to absorption. We are going to break down mechanically and chemically, absorb those nutrients, transport them around. We actually begin storing immediately in the absorptive state. And as long as blood nutrient levels are high, we continue storing, and then we convert it as we finish processing that meal, we go into a post-absorptive state. The blood glucose will begin to drop as, it, as the cells that are using glucose deplete its supply, and as the storage processes clean up the rest of the free blood glucose. But during this post-absorptive state, we then reverse that process. We begin converting carbohydrate that's stored as glycogen back to glucose as needed. Now, most of our at-rest activities are supported by the, by the fatty acids that are constantly uh, flowing around the body. Fats actually take more time to digest because of this added physical burden of breaking down those droplets and converting them to triglycerides and delivering them uh, through the lymph system to the blood. But then they establish a fairly constant level. If there is excess calorie in the body, then those uh, circulating triglycerides can be stored as fat. Uh, during the post-absorptive state, the liver especially becomes active. If you're uh, if you're reasonably nourished, you don't have a lot of excess nutrient, then the glycogen, glycogen that you just made will be converted back to glucose and released. Ongoing, we're, we're basically following the release or the storage of lipids and amino acids related to our activity level. So there is a table that summarizes the presence of hormones and their effects on metabolism. And here we get into some of the most complex and interactive hormones in the body. During the absorptive state, insulin has one specific effect, and that is increase glucose uptake and utilization on the general peripheral tissues. So the first thing I want to mention is that if you don't have insulin production, the glucose is still mobilized. It's flowing around and around your body, but you can't take it into the cells and utilize it. That's why in diabetic imbalance without insulin, your blood sugar goes high. So whereas normally we think about a target between 85 and 110, as a blood sugar level. A person in diabetic distress might have a blood sugar level of 600 or 800. That produces body-wide effects. Now, on target tissues, in the liver, it stimulates glycogenesis, meaning you have to have insulin to store the glucose as glycogen in the liver. If you can't store that, it keeps going around in the blood, another factor contributing to high blood sugar. In fat, you need insulin to store 
uh, circulating lipids, triglycerides mainly, as lipid uh, oil in the fat cells. So lipogenesis, the sequestering of fats. That's why diabetes is a wasting disease. It used to be called juvenile diabetes because here's what you would see a normal nine-year-old, healthy and active and happy. And also I would say from the observations, if, if you look at people where this occurs, where the family is well uh, provisioned, so they have enough money that they're living a healthy life and a well-nourished life. And all of a sudden, the behavior of that nine-year-old changes and they begin to lose weight. So not just fat tissues, but the flesh of their muscles begins to waste away. And this weight loss is accompanied by changes in energy and behavior. And eventually the wasting progresses to where the child dies. This is why we call this childhood or de de juvenile diabetes before we understood the mechanism. So you, you can see a couple of the effects here. You can't store, you can't polymerize glucose to take it out of the blood. You can't transport glucose into the cells. You can't uh, can, uh, transport triglycerides into the cells that are adipocytes to deposit fat. And finally, skeletal muscles glycogenesis requires insulin as well. You can't store glycogen in the muscle. So the type 1 or insulin dependent diabetes that we're dealing with uh, uh, basically uh, shows the broad reaching effects on nutrition and uh, nutrient utilization that insulin has. We're going to look at some of those specific mechanisms. In some cases, it's a transport role. Insulin is a cofactor in bringing amino acids into a cell. Insulin plus growth hormone, you'll notice, affects amino acid uptake and protein synthesis. I would also mention that sex hormones, androgens and estrogens, increase amino acid use and protein synthesis. And this is where the body conversion, both the growth of new tissues and the uh, changes in metabolic processes that affect organs and organ systems. So for example, the effect on the voice that comes from androgens, but it's not so prominent from estrogens. The effect on breast growth, on the broadening of the hips. So the pelvis grows, uh, widens in females, whereas the shoulders widen in males. Those involve active increases in protein synthesis and also effects on the skeletal muscles. In the post-absorptive state, here's glucagon. I didn't mention that name before, but insulin uh, up here causes the liver to grab glucose and make glycogen in the liver. When you get to the post-absorptive state, insulin uh, a, a release is uh, moderated and glycogen is released and that glycogenolysis we're breaking down the glycogen to make glucose to sustain blood sugar level. Epinephrine has a stimulating effect in the liver. Epinephrine, uh, as you remember, a fight or flight uh, sympathetic stimulation hormone also has an effect on uh, lipolysis, breaking down oils and lipids in adipose tissue. Glucocorticoids, we have mainly we have mentioned several times without explaining what they do. They decrease the use of glucose. And basically, uh, that means we have to rely on things like fatty acids and ketone bodies. This is an imbalance uh, if we don't have enough glucocorticoids. They also, uh, glucocorticoids also act to break down glycogen in the liver. Um, and affect fat breakdown in, in, uh, in uh, cells, in adipose cells. And gluconeogenesis, there are processes that can take other carbon fragments and make glucose out of them. And uh, glucocorticoids can produce that uh, shift. In skeletal muscles, the conversion of glycogen, but also the breakdown of protein 
and the release of amino acids are affected by glucocorticoids. Growth hormone is a general hormone. We kind of looked at that strong last semester. Growth hormone affects many different effects and especially in combination with other things. So for example, up here, we specifically called out growth hormone acting with insulin and stimulating protein synthesis. Over here in the muscle, stimulating fatty acid catabolism. Down here, growth hormone is listed as complementing the effects of glucocorticoids. So if you have uh, increased levels of these two, you get growth spurts and metabolism spurts. Conversely, if you don't have enough growth hormone or glucocorticoids, you see a decrease in those um, of peripheral metabolic activities. We generally look at a, a group of living cells and we talk about the metabolic rate. And it's the sum of all of that anabolism and catabolism everywhere in the body. It changes, of course, according to activity. Are we feeding? That produces the parasympathetic response. Are we exerting? That produces the sympathetic the exertion response and metabolic rate can be measured in several ways. As with most measurements of the human body, you have to uh, specify the conditions for the results to be comparable. So for example, body temperature is taken when we're at rest. Pulse rate is taken when we're at rest as a beginning of our doctor's appointment. The BMR, we can always start by thinking about a resting energy expenditure. Now here we are supposing that you're a normal, awake, and alert person. Your condition right now, as you listen to this lecture, is a good example of at rest. Um, it's measured under very standardized conditions in order to be comparable. And uh, the questions there that you are asked um, uh, as those measurements are taken, are relevant to understanding what the body was going through just before you started the measure. We recognize a direct connection. It goes right back to that glucose plus oxygen makes CO2 plus water. Oxygen is the constant requirement for metabolic activity. It goes way up when we exert ourselves. It comes way down uh, when we are at quote at rest but at rest what are we doing with the oxygen measurement we are summarizing the metabolic needs that include things like flow of blood to the brain a constant requirement adequate oxygen delivery to every living cell which basically is uh, summarizing the the threshold you go across that threshold, the minimum threshold, you, you have what's called anemia. So uh, since energy utilization is going to be proportional to oxygen consumption, for all levels of activity up to what I'd call maximum aerobic activity, the point at which you go anaerobic, there's an additional burst of energy that is free of the oxygen level. But right up to that level, um, the amount of oxygen is a great correlate, a great measure of your base metabolic rate. Um, quite simply, as complicated as the regulation of our energy, the uh, basically the regulation of our uh, storage of nutrients and energy, the regulation of different components, how much fat we have compared to how much muscle, all of that is a, a very delicate dance, a very delicate balance. But in fact, if you put more in than you burn up, then you store that as storage material, often as triglycerides in adipose tissue. Um, if, uh, so, so I want to make this point. A healthy body never voluntarily lets go of a calorie it never takes carbon fragments that come through diet and throws them away. It always stores in some form or burns it. 
Now, this is just a kind of a statement about the efficiency, but it also is a statement about our, our uh, the basic dynamic of our social and cultural time on Earth. We have excess calories. I mean, you can not only eat all the calories you want in a day, if you decide you want to eat pure fat, uh, most of us have the means we can do that. And so that affects our abil our body's ability to balance our caloric intake with our fat storage. If caloric expenditures exceed the dietary supply, then the body loses weight. And eventually that would mean conversion of fat stores. What it usually means for us, because we uh, talk about social and cultural. We don't eat when we're hungry. We establish a habit of eating that has a definite schedule. And when we sit down to lunch and dinner, our body is often not hungry. We do feel the pangs that relate to that cephalic stage of digestion, telling us it's time to eat. So it's stimulating us to eat, even though the body is not approaching nutrient deficiency. And so under those conditions, our psychological urge, that urge we have to gorge, to put on weight during the period of plenty, leads to this kind of profile, an obese body weight. Now, I say gorge during the period of plenty. We've just, here we're suffering from our success. We've gotten so good at providing food and growing food and storing food that the period of plenty never goes away. So what we're left with is food and drink are less about nutrition and hydration and more about the pleasure that those things give us. So we feed for taste. We eat for a sense of satiety that comes from overeating. We hydrate to and beyond the point of adequate hydration. So we basically are not emptying out the liver, emptying out the muscles between, may, uh, uh, between meals or on our overnight fasting period. We are still full, so when we put additional calories in, especially when our food science provides things that are so rich in fat and carbohydrate, um, uh, then those extra calories are going to be stored uh, in the adipocytes and uh, uh, the tanks in our muscles and liver are going to be topped off all the time. Now, hormones are important. Here are a couple important ones. Thyroxin comes from the thyroid gland. It has a general rate effect. So adequate thyroid and you burn your nutrients. Inadequate thyroid, you feel tired, you feel uh, lacks of energy and so forth. Leptin is from adipose tissue. Uh, it's released during the absorptive state. And it's interesting effect. If you have leptin, leptin release, it's binding receptors in the central nervous system. And what it does is suppress appetite. So uh, it, in terms of controlling our impulses to feed leptin is important. Heat production. Energy is captured uh, if that is not captured, that's 60% that we saw in the first figure. It's released as heat. Now, in most initially, that is heat that is just escaping the chemical balance that we've been looking at, the production of ATP. However, it represents an opportunity. For most organisms on Earth, that heat is simply released back into the environment. It has escaped from the cell out to the outside. However, there is a chemical effect on our metabolism from temperature. Warm temperature typically means faster reactions. Cold temperature means that reactions slow down. And from an animal that cannot 
make heat in their body. We see their behavior both on a daily basis and on a seasonal basis change with the seasons. So a snake cannot make heat. And by the way, in making ATP, a snake is releasing that 60% just like our cells do. But it's escaping. On a day like this where it's 92 degrees, that snake's body is warm enough that it can move quickly, it can hunt effectively. But when autumn comes and the daily temperature goes down, it literally slows down the metabolism of the whole animal. Around here, snakes have to seek dens, which are underground. So you have to go far enough into the earth that you cross that frost line. You don't want to let, you don't want to freeze, and you're you you become a torpid, a state of torpor. If you've ever been into a snake den in the winter, they see you and they move. They move so slowly because they're so cold. The temperature there may be 50 degrees or 45 degrees. So that is something that, you know, all reptiles, all amphibians have to accommodate to is that they're going to be inactive in cold weather. You're going to find lots of those groups <coughs> at the equator where it's always warm. They're going to be active year round. But as you come north into these temperate regions, especially like Missouri, think about Minnesota, places like um, Canada, where you find in the summer, you do find snakes, you find turtles, you find lizards, but you do not find them active in the winter. And they seek a time when they basically slow their metabolism close to zero to survive the cold time. Now, in our bodies, however, there's been a main shift in the evolution of our body to establish a homeostasis for a constant body temperature. Not just a constant temperature, but a high temperature. It's not just that it's constant. The important thing is that it's 98.6, which is high enough that there's, there's very rapid metabolism going on in our cells. We achieve this through thermoregulation. There are certain cellular um, reactions that contribute to this, but mostly it's the energy that's released through ATP production that's being captured, being retained. So thermoregulation is the idea is this, is let's retain that escaping heat and use it to maintain this constant body temperature and a year round hot or cold metabolism. So thermoregulation is designed, it only works within certain ranges, of course, but as things get cold, we're going to maximize heat retention in the body. As things get warm and or as we become more physically active. When I said we make ATP, we burn it so fast in the muscles that that 60% is being generated every step, every single muscle contraction generates more and more of that 62%. So under those conditions, we are maximizing heat release from the body. So the idea is that we can retain or shed heat is what we call thermoregulation. Now, the body can do something additional. When we are retaining heat, we can actually take food and convert it into heat. And here we'll talk about this, but the basic strategy is shivering, which is the asynchronous contraction of the muscle. When I contract this biceps brachii together, it flexes the elbow. But under cold conditions, it's going to take those motor units and instead of firing them in sequence or causing them to contract all at once, it's going to basically contract them out of sequence. So the muscle shakes back and forth as a sign of thermal regulation. During that, those contractions, you're not moving the skeleton. You're releasing that 60% of the heat that's released when we make ATP. So let's just review this first portion.
of the metabolism lecture. The idea first, aerobic cellular, these are the big ideas. Aerobic cellular respiration requires oxygen. Where does it come from? We know that it comes from the air. 20 to 21 percent of our air is oxygen. We know the respiratory system produces the transport of that air, the absorption of the oxygen to the cardiovascular delivery system that will transport it to every living cell. And part and parcel of that is generating CO2, which is going to be transported back to our gas exchange system for release. Aerobic cellular respiration requires nutrients. Where do they come from? Well, from our feet and our digestive tract. Food contains polymers, which contain monomers. Those are our nutrients. And again, the cardiovascular system providing that linking role between digestion and transport to every living cell. Aerobic cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide. Now that is the result. You deliver nutrients, you deliver oxygen to the cell. Aerobic respiration breaks it down to CO2 and water. The cardiovascular system to the respiratory system is the link from in solution in the blood and plasma to release uh, in gaseous form from the respiratory tract. Aerobic cellular respiration produces ATP. Its role in the cell is as the energy currency. We're going to spend it like dollars wherever we have a specific bit of cellular work to do. Metabolism produces heat. That's useful to us because we capture that heat and gives us a year-round metabolism. Now, that comes with some fuss. Because we make heat, we have a high level of energy consumption. I mentioned how lethargic snakes or turtles appear. But they basically, during the time of plenty, they sequester some stored reserves. Turtles will burrow into the ground dig into the ground, or if they're aquatic turtles, they will dig into the, mud, into the mud at the bottom of the pond. And the colder it gets, the deeper they go. But they slow their metabolism down to such a level that there are certain sensitive tissues around their body. So around their cloaca, which is the common urogenital outlet, and around their mouth and in their mouth, there are capillary beds very near the surface. They can actually draw enough oxygen from the water that they can support the metabolism of the turtle and keep it alive. Now, that means that being a, a so-called cold-blooded animal has an advantage. You don't actually need to eat or breathe actively during those cold times. It also means that certain cold-blooded animals don't need to eat as often because you're not needing to make heat. Um, a reminder next, nutrients serve two roles in the body. What are they? Building blocks and the delivery of energy. Two hormones that affected the overall metabolic rate were leptin and um, thyroxin, affecting uh, overall BMR for the body. What organelle would be most uh, be abundant in the tissues that use large amounts of ATP? This is an old acquaintance, the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion, the site of cellular respiration. And we have seen this again and again. When we studied muscles, we noticed that muscle fibers and skeletal muscles, cardiac muscle cells, and smooth muscle cells are packed with mitochondria. Since they consume, since they need ATP and consume it at the greatest rate, and often that consumption is related to the survival of the organism. 
there's been a an accommodation so that it's not an equal number of mitochondrion in every cell. Those cells that use ATP fastest have a super supply. Well, to return to the review and try to tie up material that we have received and reviewed and, and talked about in previous lectures. There's three major nutrient groups that are listed on your nutrition label, on your power bar. And that's basically related to a, a, a measure called calorimetry. What we do is we can take anything, it doesn't have to be a nutrient, and we put it in a big iron vessel that can be sealed. It has a thing like a spark plug, which will fire. And then we pump it full of what they call excess atmospheres of oxygen. We basically pressurize it with pure oxygen. So when you spark it, it causes the material inside to start to burn. Because there's excess oxygen, it burns completely to CO2 and water if it's organic material. So what you do is you immerse this big iron thing into a, into a water bath with a lot of water and you fire off that burning process. You watch the temperature go up. The temperature that goes up is related to the calories released when you burn it. So a calorie is the amount of heat that causes one cubic centimeter of water to increase one degree centigrade. So you can, by knowing the mass of the material you put in and the number of degrees that go up in the water. Now you're heating up the entire bath, but you're also in uh, the, the bomb, which is the big metal container, and you're heating up the water. And by knowing the mass of those things, you can figure out how many calories were released. That's how we estimate the calories in our food. So we started with glucose as our example. A carbohydrate does have quite a bit of energy. And when it's burned in our body, it releases CO2 and water. Carbohydrate metabolism is a basis for ATP production. But it's also important to realize that this can be replaced by carbon fragments, so amino acids, fatty acids, acetyl groups are going to be shoved into this system whenever we need ATP. The, the rest of the uh, PowerPoint is going to go through and illustrate and reinforce what we have, what we've been saying all this semester and last about biochemical reactions in the body. What did we say about them? They're carbon chemistry, working with carbon monomers, monomers and carbon polymers. They often involve specific helpers for every reaction. When you have a reactant being converted to a product, that often does not happen unless you have the right enzyme present to perform the conversion. That enzyme is just an example of one of the proteins in the body. But in fact, when we talk about, we've been talking about ATP production, and that doesn't require one enzyme. It requires an enzyme at every step. We're going to see the breaking of bonds in order to release energy and the coupling of that release of chemical energy to the production of ATP. By that, I mean the phosphorylation of ADP. So ADP plus P has to be there as a reactant. That energy flows over and causes the phosphate to be stuck on the ADP to generate ATP. We start this process for glucose in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, this is such an incomplete diagram, and you'll recognize some of the steps. Here is blood glucose drawn just as six carbons in a line. That's not very good drawing, but for our purposes it will help show how glucose is treated. We know, for example, just this from this position where the pointer is to this position where the number one is, 
we know that you have to have insulin to cross that boundary. But we first transport the glucose into the cell. Now this is facilitated transport. So if the capillaries are delivering blood glucose outside the cell, that blood glucose is diffusing into these spaces and the facilitated transport mechanism is shoving it into the cell where it immediately is consumed. After the first reaction, it's no longer pure glucose. So it continues to move this direction. But here we do a curious thing. The first thing we do is raise the energy level of the glucose by sticking a phosphate first on one end and another one on the other end. To do that, we burn two ATPs. So the first thing we do when the glucose enters the cell is not split it apart, glycolysis, but energize it with two ATPs. So here's the first one, here's the second one, and we have what's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So, so far, we haven't gotten any ATP out of it. We've invested two. But then it's high energy and an enzyme, enzyme number three, splits it into these two three carbon pieces. Now it turns out that ends are different, but this piece, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, is immediately converted over to a second molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So glycolysis, which is what this process is, occurs in the cytoplasm, you'll notice, does not require any oxygen, burns to ATP, and generates two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. Now, that's the early part of glycolysis. From that point, look at what happens. You need two phosphates coming in, and energy is transferred from those glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates to a carrier called NAD. Now, NAD is going to form NADH. This is an energy carrier, an electron carrier. So although it's not ATP, it represents a significant harvest and storage of electron energy. Notice that two phosphates come in and you stick them onto the other end of the glyceraldehyde, glyceraldehyde phosphate, producing two molecules of 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate. These two three carbon pieces now have a lot of energy and each of them in the next step, step five, a molecule of ATP is formed from each of these. Isn't this interesting? We transfer energy from the three carbon over to the NADA. So we bleed that off here. We put two phosphates in and then immediately take them right back to produce two ATP. So we've paid our debt. We're now back to zero on ATPs. The next step just generates water, no energy gain. But the final step, the phosphates on this, this region, this carrier called phosphoenopyruvate or PEP, makes two more ATP and you have two molecules of the end product of glycolysis called pyruvate. So over here, you're seeing the ATP summary, minus two plus two plus two, glycolysis gives you a net gain of plus two ATP, not much. When you have an anaerobic bacteria that can only do glycolysis, it's making a net of two ATP and it's throwing this away. This has lots of energy, so bacteria are going to grow much slower. This is the summary of glycolysis. In the cytoplasm, it does not require oxygen. The next thing we're going to have to do is move that pyruvate in the human cell from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. Now here we have an inner membrane. The outer membrane has big pores, so ions and small molecules like pyruvate go right through it. 
And because this is a source sink relationship, you're generating pyruvate in piles in the cytoplasm. It's going through these pores into the mitochondrion by diffusion. But the inner membrane chops that inner space up. There's a space that's between the outer membrane and inner membrane, and there's a space that's within the inner membrane. This is where all the carrier proteins and enzymes that move and work on the pyruvate are going to be located. And the intermembrane space uh, is separated by that inner membrane from the outer space within the mitochondrion. This is where we start what we call aerobic respiration. And this is a great place to pause and basically say that we will take this up again uh, in the next recorded lecture.